Hello, everybody. Um, again, welcome to the FRCS Mentor Group. Um, some housekeeping rules first. If uh, anybody who isn't uh, speaking, please put on, put off your mics. Um, at the very, if you have questions, please use the chat function. Um, we use the hand up function for uh, Viper practice at the end of the uh, uh, session, which is not recorded. And um, today's uh, session is going to be by Ajit, uh, sorry, Ajit uh, Apohami, who's a consultant trauma and orthopedic surgeon in, with the health ministry in Sri Lanka. He's, we're very lucky to have him presenting about bone, bone today, specifically bone grafting, bone physiology, and bone banking. Uh, quite an important topic, and it's a topic which is though covered in a lot of textbooks, is not covered in a kind of concise uh, way, which uh, I look forward to hearing uh, Ajit's uh, talk today. Uh, without further uh, delay, um, we'll uh, we start. Um, go ahead, Ajit. Yeah, thank you, Sean. Hi, guys. Good evening. So today, as Sean said, I'm Ajit Takhan from Sri Lanka. So I will talk about very important topic for a Farsi's exam, from orthopedic exam, born. Because I selected this topic uh, because it's a very common question comes to MCQs and even for Viva table. And another important is born is a very easy cash topic. If you know the fact, you present it very methodically, very structured pattern. And there are many definitions you need to know at the tip of your tongue if you present it in your exam under bone pathology, bone viva, so you can easily score high marks. And another important thing I want to emphasize in my lecture, because there are a few diagrams they commonly ask in viva exam. So I have made uh, all diagrams in this lecture, all handmade diagrams, you to understand uh, how to draw is a quick structured uh, diagram in the uh, in during your exam to explain your examiner. So, so I hope that will help for you to get a good idea about these diagrams and the uh, bond topic concentrating on MCQ and this Y1. Okay. Now we'll move. Usually in exam, they will enter in a in viva table, they will show you this kind of a picture. This is a true experience I am sharing with you. In my viva table, in basic science, they showed this picture and asked, What is this? Now imagine every as everybody knows, this is a female, but I don't think you should talk about FEMA here because this is not anatomy viva. This is a first storm or with the basic science table. So as a common sense, you need to understand, okay, this examiner asked about bone. So if they ask what is this, then you need to talk about bone. So it's very important rather than wasting your time. This is how sometimes examiners start your viva discussion. So, so what is bone? Bone is a composite and dynamic form of specialized connective tissue, which is anisotropic. So this definition definitely you need to know. Anisotropic means that is their mechanical property will change according to the direction directions of the load applied. So then you to talk about the composition. When you talk about the composition, always divide and talk because try to emphasize your examiner that you are a very, you know, methodical candidate because that will give you more marks. So composition can be cellular cell component and the extracellular substance. Cell substance about 10% and rest of the whole majority comes as extracellular substance, so nearly 90%. Cell, cell substances, osteocytes, osteoclasts, Osteoblast and bone lining cells. Extracellular substances again we divide into organic and inorganic cells. Organic substance type 1 collagen proteoglycan mainly. Inorganic substances 
calcium phosphate, calcium sulfate, calcium oxalate, hydroxyapatite. If you start with this kind of a answer with the definition and divide in composition, then examiner will be really impressed and he will, uh, he will continue the viva table without any problem and you will easily achieve a good mark. Next important thing you need to know, what are the functions of the bone? You don't have to know in detail and a very minor, minor structures. There are four main functions. These are the four main functions you need to remember to talk in your viva table. Structural support, protect the internal organ, hemopoiesis, and is a calcium and phosphate reservoir. Done. Only for this mention, that is more than enough. Then you need to know about the structural types of the bone. This is a very common area they ask because they ask, okay, ask what are the type of bone structures you know. Then you need to know immature bones and mature bones. Immature bones are woven bones. Mature bones is a lamellar bone. If the lamellar bone is a very common area, they will question and they will ask you to draw lamellar bone structure. That's why I, at the beginning of this lecture, you need to know some kind of diagrams under this bone topic. Under one bones, we will talk these collagen fibers are arranged very randomly, haphazardly. But in lamellar bones, there has a stress-oriented uh, collagen fiber arrangement. And lamellar bones, example, cortical and cancellous bone. But woven bone examples are embryonic and neonatal skeletal, metaphysis of groin bone, fracture callus, and pathological bones like tumors, pagistic. This woven bones are, there is no lamellar arrangement. But in lamellar bone, there is a particular lamellar arrangement. I will discuss that in later. Now, the important fact is the MCQ point, these woven bones are isotropic. At the beginning of definition, I told that bones, we, under definition, we basically give the lamellar bone definition. At that, under that definition, we discuss is an isotropic. But woven bones are isotropic. That is the MCQ point. You need to remember if the stem says is woven bones, mechanical property, if the isotropic, that is correct. Isotropic means it has a universal mechanical property in all directions of low depth. Here I have mentioned two questions. What are the differences between cortical and cancellous bone? That is a common value of question. Another thing is draw the Havasian system. If you go to the Havasian system, this is the hand. You need to know this kind of a very uh, simple diagram. Here we can see the, this collagen fiber arrangement like lamellae. And we can see the oblique arrangement in adjacent uh, layers. And there are five to seven layers arrangement and periosteum and endosteum. And in between, uh, at the middle of, we can see the Havasian canal, which contains blood vessels. And those are connecting with this, uh, this uh, Walkman canals. Everything you need to know how to do the diagram. And this, we can see the osteocytes, and which are connecting with canaliculi. And if you draw this kind of a very simple diagram, that is more than enough in your exam. At the same time, I have taken a textbook diagram as well to you to explain, because this kind of a diagram, it's not possible to draw in your exam viva table, because whatever the diagram you have to draw within a, you know, two, three seconds. So that's why I always advise you to practice this kind of your own method of diagram then it's easy to carry on your rest of, uh, quickly keep your flow. These are the differences between the cortical and cancellous bones. Cancellous the cortical bones are always dense and very strong. It has a particular Havasian system and it has a lamellar arrangement. Compared to this cancellous bone, their metabolic turnover is quite less, but in met cancellous bone, it has eight times metabolic turnover compared to cortical bone. And it has more cells in the cancellous bone compared to cortical bone. And cortical bones we commonly see in the diaphysis and keboid bone, while this cancellous bone we can see in the metaphysis, epiphysis, and the center of the keboid bone. If you quickly uh, list out these differences, that's enough in your viva table. Then we, we need, you need to know about cell types. 
this is this is area very important and they frequently question in your mcq papers that's why i have highlighted different uh, buzzwords here because they frequently ask these words and these areas in your mcq paper i mentioned previously there are four types of cells in the bone osteoblast osteocytes osteoclast and bone lining cell when you go to the osteoblast that is derived from undifferentiated mesenchymal stem cells that is the mcq point in the bone marrow they produce osteoid which contain collagen type 1 it has a greater synthetic capacity what happened this main type of osteoblast the differentiation of this osteoblast is mediated by bone mineral proteins and cytokines what is the ultimate fate of this osteoblast because majority they convert it into osteocyte they trapped inside the uh, cancellous bone matrix that uh, <coughs> Cal calcified bone matrix and they convert into osteocyte and rest of the amount they convert into dormant state they become inactive bone lining cell and few uh, die they go into apoptosis then osteocyte as i said you before is a, is trapped in the calcified bone matrix that is the main main type of cells in the bone about 90% it has intercellular connections with canal nuclei and this osteocytes is the main function it is important for calcium and phosphate metabolism which is responsible for parathyroid hormone and calcitonin i will discuss that later when i discuss the calcium metabolism bone lining cell it's a kind of dormant cells lining the uh, on the surface of the bone periosteum and endosteum it is in inactive form whenever need they are happy to reactivate and bond newborn formation it's mainly a, a contribute for apposition of the bone and osteoclast that is a very important bone you need to know about this in and out because it's common location in the mcq and your viva exam osteoclast function and diagram and everything they ask in the viva paper <clears throat> osteoclast arise from hemopoietic hematopoietic macrophages and monocyte stem cell line is a large multinucleate giant cell <coughs> here the functions of osteoblast and osteoclast this is the keyword you need to use that's a coupling mechanism because bone resorption and bone formation it's a coupling mechanism it's a coupling of osteoblast and osteoclast there are cytokines interleukin 1 mainly that is the mcq point interleukin 6 human necrotic factor alpha and platelet derived growth factor those are cytokines which stimulate and which upregulate the rank ligand receptors rank ligand in the osteoblast what happened that after upregulating this increase the number of rank ligand on the surface of osteoblast they go and combine with the rank receptors on the osteoclast and they couple they bind and they stimulate osteoclast and make it maturization that is yeah. rank ligand from osteoblast yeah. and rank receptors from the osteoclast yeah Right. yeah and they bind and they form the uh, they 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 stimulate the maturation of osteoclast then they stim uh, they get the osteoclast function this is osteoclast function you need to know how to draw this diagram because they commonly ask how osteoclast function because osteoclast main function is a bone resorption and that involved in for that involved in for remodeling process so you need to know it it has it's a large cell it has multinuclear cell and it has a brush board that is called ruffle border and it's combined with the hawkins lapine it's a pit of the bone surface and it's it's combined by intergreen bonds 
what happens they have to degrade this bone organic and inorganic substance for bone resorption how they degrade this resorption happen with inorganic substances they create a low ph area low ph atmosphere within this bony pit is a hawkins vacuum there are three ways this are mcq and this viva questions there are three ways they produce low ph one thing is a carbonic anhydrase second one is a atp dependent proton pump mechanism third one is a so sodium hydrogen exchange system through these three ways they produce low ph and that dissolve hydroxy appetite that's how they dissolve this inorganic substance when you come to the organic substance so they secrete lysosomal degradating enzyme tartrate resistant acid phosphatase and catechins in the hydrolyzed organic substance you need to know how to draw this diagram and explain this to mechanism of the uh, to explain the resorption functions of the your class so there are two receptors here rank receptor and calcitonin receptors i will discuss that later so osteoclast activation as i said you before by mainly rank ligand and interleukin 1 osteoclast inhibition by calcitonin and interleukin 10 these are mcq points now we get into the bond matrix we discuss about bond cells now we discuss about bond matrix bond bond matrix mainly inorganic and organic substances inorganic hydroxy apatite calcium hydroxy apatite you need to know how to write this equation in your viva sometimes they will ask sometimes even for mcq paper and out of that 99% of body calcium we can see in the bone and 85% of body phosphate in the bone and 40 to 60% of total body sodium and potassium we can see and this inorganic substance mainly this hydroxy apatite calcium hydroxy apatite responsible for compression strength of the bone that is the mcq point it's a compression strength of the bone when you go into inorganic substance mainly type 1 collagen 90% of made, uh, organic substance it contains type 1 collagen that is responsible for tensile strength of the pore now we are going to blood supply of the bone this blood supply of the bone you need to know there are three main supply one thing is high pressure system low pressure system that is through the periosteal blood supply and third one is the metaphyseal and epiphyseal blood supply you remember that trio that's enough so high pressure system it is mainly from the nutrient artery from the nutrient foramen that supply to uh, it enter to the medullary canal at the diaphyseal region then it supply from endosteum to periosteum from inside to outside that is the main supply that is called centrifugal circulation the normally bone has centrifugal because it supply to inner two third so it starting from inside then it supply towards outside what happen when you are doing reamin from the intramedullary nail in that is a common viva question they are start with the blood supply of the bone then they will question about okay intramedullary tell me what is the alterations of the circulation then you need to know that reverse this centrifugal circulation to centripetal centripetal circulation what happened due to reaming of the endosteum the circulation get disturbed then it start circulation from outside to inside that is called centripetal that is the important point you need to know about circulation of the blood cell this diagram also clearly shows this is from inside to out that is centrifugal this is outside to in that is centripetal okay little bit about periosteum this is a 
outer covering of the bone. It's composed of two layers, outer fibrous layer and inner cellular layer. It has four main functions that is important for apposition growth of the bone. It gives the blood supply out of one third and it provides the attachment to tendons, muscles, ligaments, and it prevents the spillage of bony tissues in the adjacent soft tissue. Now we are getting to the very important area. Now, now we talk, finish about basic area of the bone blood so uh, that bone composition cells then matrix and circulation now we are getting to very important topic important area and they frequently question about this in your viva table and even mcq table that is calcium metabolism you need to know you need to know the diagram of this also but looking at the diagram, it, it will, it, you might feel it's very complicated. But once you understand the real concept of that, it's a very easy to draw the diagram in your exam. So calcium metabolism usually is a 2.5 millimeters normally. Calcium, calcium is important for nerve stimulation, conduction, muscle contraction, hormone function, and activation of clotting cascades. What are the important hormones? Involved in this calcium metabolism, parathyroid hormone, which is secreted from uh, chief cells from uh, parathyroid gland, and 125 dihydrocholic calciferol, calcitonin, that is uh, C cells from thyroid gland, and uh, corticosteroid and estrogen. Okay. This is the diagram, but I understand it's by looking at this, you might feel it's really confusing, but I will tell you one by step by step, then you will see it because you need to know how to draw this diagram in your wire table. So this UV light comes in our body in the skin has seven dihydrocholesterol. This transport and even the, through the diet we get seven dihydrocholic calciferol. It comes to the liver. From here, it is catalyzed by 25 hydroxylase. It converts into 25 dihydrocholic calciferol. Then it goes to kidney, proximal convoluted tubules. It contains one alpha hydroxylase. In the proximal convoluted tubule, by catalyzing this this one alpha hydroxylase enzyme, they are converting this 25 dihydrocholic calciferol convert into 125 dihydrocholic calciferol. This 125 dihydrocholic calciferol, they function in three places. One thing is it act on the Act to the kidney, it helps to calcium reabsorption and increase phosphate excretion. Then it act to gut, increase calcium absorption by increasing calcium binding receptors in the duodenum. Then it act on the bone. How do they act on the bone? They do not act, they stimulate bone resorption to increase the calcium level in the blood. How do they act? They will not directly act to the osteoclast for bone resorption. What they are doing, they act on the osteoblast first. They upregulate rank ligand. Then they bind to rank receptors of the osteoclast through that they stimulate osteoclast and increase bone resorption. So that is a very important area and the MCQ point they will ask sometimes this 125 diet called calciferol directly act on the osteoclast? No, it acts through osteoblast. So you need to know that three function of this 125 diet calciferol. Then parathyroid hormone. 
This is secreted from chief cells of the thyroid, uh, parathyroid gland. They, that also act in two, three areas, mainly to the kidney by increasing one alpha hydroxylase that stimulate productions of 125 dihydrocholic alciferol. Another thing is they act on bone. Again, it acts to osteoblast, to osteoclast, and that stimulate bone resorption. In addition to that, that indirectly acts to the gut parathyroid hormone by increasing production of 125 dihydrocholic calciferol and increase the calcium absorption. That is how increase the calcium level whenever the calcium level is low. But when the calcium level is high, then calcitonin come into the action. What happened? That uh, C cells from thyroid gland, they secret calcitonin, that directly act on osteoclast. That is the MCQ point you need to know. That calcitonin, because there is a calcitonin receptor on the osteoclast. I showed in the previous diagram, I show you the diagram of the osteoclast here. You can see the receptor, calcitonin receptor on the uh, osteoclast. So it directly acts on osteoclast and they reduce, they compromise the osteoclast function. There are three ways they compromise. They flatten the roughened border and they stimulate apoptosis and they reduce osteoclast motility and they reduce the cytoplasmic extension through that they reduce osteoclastic function and they compromise they stop bone resorption that is the calcium metabolism now in the viva table if they ask, okay, tell me the calcium metabolism, and if you draw this diagram, if you practice yourself and draw this diagram and explain while you are drawing, then I believe you can score very good mark. Now we are entering into the uh, different area, fracture healing. Again, very important area, the fracture healing, it is, there are two discrete process we talk about here, intramembranous ossification and endochondral ossification. This intramembranous ossification, this is kind of a bone formation because there are undifferentiated, there are multipotent stem cells under periosteum. These multipotent stem cells, they, convert into osteoprogenitor cells and they directly lay down new bonds that is osteomembranous ossification. But this new bond formation is not sufficient to bridge the fracture. What happens? They give edges. Edges become more whitened and uh, thicker. That is what we can see in the X-ray at the initial part of the healing process that is intermembranous ossification. But it doesn't bridge the fracture. But when you are talking about the bridging of the fracture through healing, its endochondral ossification plays a big role. That is the important area we discuss under fracture healing, that is endochondral ossification. Fracture healing, there are two types, primary healing and secondary healing. In your exam, can you just, if examiner asks in your basic prior table, explain the fracture healing steps. I believe you need to explain about secondary healing steps. So there are four steps we talk here. Start with blood clot formation. It's a platelet aggregation and clot formation. 
this the sacred plate derived growth factors that activate the cotton cascade and complement cascade that happen as step by step iteration those are the key words you need to use then second step is the inflammation when you talk about inflammation there are three buzzwords you need to mutter tell chemotactic angiogenic and osteoinduction chemotactic comes with phagocytosis this phagocytosis they killed they engulf all dead cells and debris that happens initially first with neutrophils which is followed by macrophages then angiogenesis is a new vessel formations at the fracture site they produce they transport undifferentiated mesenchymal cells to the fracture site to differentiate later on and in addition to that they transport osteoinductive substances like bone mineral protein that stimulate healing process third step is a repair phase that is the phase we form callus forming when you talk about the repair phase, a repair phase this current strain here is very important you need to mention in your exam that is the parent strain theory that the its repair process happen depend on the mechanical and chemical environment chemical environment those are the substances cytokines bone mineral protein mechanical environment means the strain at the fractures level if the strain is less than 2% it's healed by primary bone heal so it need absolute anatomical reduction with interfragmented compression i will tell that later is a according to the strain according to the parent strain theory depend on the strain level type of healing repair process changes if the strain is less than 2 it will heal by primary bone healing if the strain is 2 to 10% that's where that secondary healing happens if it is more than 17 it happens fibrous union up to 100% it's so granulation tissue forms you need to know about parent strain theory mentioned here that is a buzzword the last step is a remodeling phase that is a long process that happens over years here you need to talk about wolf law because it obeys the wolf law that's a balance between the anabolic and catabolic phase of the body that's the balance between osteoblastic and osteo resorption so remodeling process you need to know and you need to know the diagram even to draw how remodeling happens before that i will tell i will tell what is wolf flow sometimes they will last but if you know wolf flow that's enough but better to know the what if in if in case they ask what is wolf flow if you know the wolf flow then it sounds really good so bone consumes that configuration and bone shape based on the stressed actin on it this osteoclast activity being predominant on tension side especially in the electropositive tension side osteoblast activity is be more dominant on electronegative compression side so that all wool flow is depend on the stress applied on the then remodeling happens when you talk about remodeling you better know you need to know how to draw this remodeling mechanism with the diagram like this i as i said you that it involved in osteoblast and osteoclast both in malmo what happened this parathyroid hormone that recruit osteoclast formation and they bind with the bone surface with the ruffle border they go to the hawkins lacune and combine they start resorption like as i said you before in inorganic and organic substances they dissolve they start resorption while resorption what happen insulin like growth factor 1 liberated from bone this insulin like growth factor they act again 
at the same site osteoblast what happened this osteoblast activation happened in addition to that osteoblast differentiation of uh, this differentiation of precursor cells to osteoblast happened by in the presence of bone mineral protein and other hormone like estrogen so mainly insulin like growth factor one that is the mcq point what happened this they start bone formation bone resorption happen at the same time it bone formation happen while bone formation what happened this activated osteoblast they secrete interleukin 6 this interleukin 6 at the same time they stimulate again recruitment of osteoclast and again stimulate bone resorption through stimulate in osteoclast this happened concurrently at the same time they embedded more while they are forming like they are lay down new bone they embedded again that interleukin uh, insulin like growth factor one so this osteoclast resorption and osteoblast deposition that happens concurrently at the same so it it is remodeling process it happens according to the wolf law if you know how to draw this diagram if you know how to explain the remodeling and the wolf law that's enough for your example now we are getting to primary healing that is primary healing means we have to talk about cutting cord here this cutting cord it's it's mainly formed by osteoclast what by this osteoclast they form a tunnel through the fracture and they create the pathway and subsequently what happen this new vessels angiogenesis and followed by osteoblast coming behind that and this osteoblast they re directly lay down new bones that is osteoid this cutting cord this is also i i drew my handmade diagram you to understand because very easy diagram in your exam only few seconds draw start with this sharp edge that is a cutting zone then reversal zone you need to draw the diagram and this inverted uh, this reverse shape v shape this osteoblast cell arrangement then uh, closing zone is the osteoid deposition done so primary healing we talk about this cutting cord if you this is a diagram this is complicated you can't draw this diagram in your exam the primary bone healing is this cutting cord it is starting with this edge is a osteoclast that forms a tunnel through the fractula to pathway make the tunnel then followed by this a new gen uh, this uh, blood vessels come and osteoblast come then osteoblast lay down new bone formation osteoid so you need to know this simple diagram to draw in your exam because i'll show you a textbook diagrams are very complicated these are very complicated but if you uh, if you practice before your exam this time a very simple your own diagram method that would be very easy to remember and because it it's very 2 3 seconds you can spend for your diagram so so that's all about cutting cords and the primary healing okay when you talk about the primary healing so do you need to have absolute stability those are requirements absolute stability achieved by anatomical re reduction and interfragmentary compression so where where the this compression plate get the primary healing and the lax tool those are the main areas we can see the primary healing okay this is a very important question in viva table what are the differences between the primary healing and secondary healing? primary healing it needs absolute stability with anatomical reduction secondary healing happens with relative stability the fracture gap strain for primary healing should be less than 
but strain should be more than two to uh, between two to ten percent for secondary healing. And we can see cut in cones, but no cancer, no callus formation, no remodeling. X-ray we can't see callus formation in primary healing. But secondary healing we can see callus formation, industrial ossification, and we can see remodeling and X-ray we can see callus formation. If you mention these two differences, that's enough in your example. What are the factors? I will rush this. These are local factors, systemic factors. You know all these things. So these are uh, textbook theories. I have not spent more time for this. Okay, spectrum of the abnormal healing. Delayed union, fibrous union, non-union. Non-union, you need to know. It's a different, separate topic. I will not talk about non-union in this topic. Uh, the non-union, there are three types, atrophic, oligotrophic, and hypertrophic. That's all I discussed here, but it's a separate vast area. It's a separate viva topic. So I will, if you want, I can discuss it later. Okay. Now I go into different area that is bone grafting. Very important. They frequently question about this, especially in the viva table and even in MC. You need to know what is bone grafting. Because if you mention definition, very healthy definition, that shows how you are confident. That helps you to make a good impression about you in your examiner's mind. So definition of bone grafting is a use of implanted material alone uh, combined with other material which promote bone healing by providing osteoinduction, osteoconduction, and osteogenic to the local side. Very important, you need to mention about that three buzzword, osteoinduction, osteoconduction, and osteogenic. What are the bone grafting? Allograft, autograft, xenograft, and synthetic graft. What are the functions? We talk about bone grafting, mechanical function and biological function. What is osteoinduction? Osteoinduction is a biological stimulus of the graft. Stimulate mitosis and differentiation of undifferentiated mesenchymal cells into progenitor cells or ultimately newborn formation. What are the substances that induce osteoinduction? Bone mineral protein, insulin-like growth factors one and two, fibroblast growth factor, and colonic stimulating factors. Those are insecure. What is osteoconduction? Osteoconduction, it provides a tri-dimensional scaffolding structure support for the bone formation, which supports the ingrowth of capillaries, perivascular tissues, and osteogenic prickles. The basis is give the scaffolding support. Osteogenesis means ability of graft to lay down bone that graft got living prickles cells. It has live cells, so it can produce them itself new bone from graft first. So that is osteogenesis. You need to know these three functions to explain in your exam. What are the graft substitutes? There are cell-based substitutes, factors-based substitute, substitutes, and calcium phosphate, calcium carbonate, hydroxyapatite, carolin, and calcium sulfate, and so many things. What are the other augmenting fracture healing methods? So systemic enhancement, that means giving substances, sometimes injury to distal skeletal, so sometimes they do co co cortex osteotomy to stimulate healing, electromagnetic field, low incentive pulse, ultrasound therapy, oxygen therapy, those things. I, I include this slide to sake of completions of the fracture healing. So, Little bit know about it, that's it. Yeah. Okay, this is again new area graph incorporation. You need to know about this because they can ask 
if they are started your viva table with bone grafting eventually that they will ask about graft incorporation graft incorporation it's a process which with invasion of the graft by the host spore you need to tell that so there are three four stages here also start with inflammatory process then revascularization and osteo induction then osteo conduction then remodeling out of this four method this cortical graft and cancellous graft this first two methods are common is a common viva topic is a, what are the differences between the cortical graft incorporation and the cancellous graft incorporation if you know that fact that is more than enough under graft incorporation that's all you need to know under graft incorporation cancellous graft incorporation this is very quick process compared to cortical grafting because revascularization inflammatory process that all happens very rapidly phase 1 is very rapid then phase 2 is a creep substitution that is a buzzword that is the mcq creep substitution mean that mean osteoblast lay down over dead trapezule that scaffold in this scaffold of the graft while osteoclast resorption simultaneously that happens concurrently because of initial osteoblast lay down that early excess that excess shows the early de increase the density of the excess third phase is a remodeling what happened remodeling along the trabeculae along the lines of force with associated decrease with that that will decrease the bond uh, radio density remember three phase and remember creep substitution under cancellous graft incorporation when you go to cortical graft incorporation again that first two steps happens here also but it slowly compared to cortical graft incorporation when you go to phase 2 it has osteoclast resorption via cutting cone this is the buzzword you need to talk in cortical graft in common cutting cone happen initially osteoclast bond resorption then bond formation happen that is why first initial stage this once the cortical graft we applied that mechanical strength is reduced is 40 60% reduced but it come to normal level over one year time so as a summary if you know these two differences under this graft incorporation cortical and cancellous graft incorporation initially it's a rapid process inflammation and revascularizing this is a slow process and we can see that creep substitution under cancellous but cortical we can see cutting cone and entire graft incorporated in cancellous bone but entire graft not incorporated in cortical bone and there is no in remodel uh, there is a remodeling in cancellous graft but no remodeling phase in cortical graft that happens only cutting cone that's all about graft incorporation then bone banking this is a very hot area topic they will ask and if you know these steps and if they ask about tell me something about bone bank if you can tell quickly step by step and keep on talking i think that's more than enough in your exam you can start with it's a complex process with multiple steps start with donor selection then once you select your donor you have to get the consent from the donor if it's a live donor we have to get the consent for screening process hiv screening syphilis hepatitis and we need to access this personal medical records we need to get all this for consent if there is a cadaveric craft so we have to get the consent from his next kin then third step is a donor screening 
you have to scan his medical records plus his behavioral history because if he's a drug abuse drug iv drug user so is it is a exclusion criteria we can't use bone graft from a drug user so it's important to know about his behavioral history as well when you are seen in the door so we have to get the detail history if he's a live donor we have to get your uh, their relations and if you want you can contact gp practitioner and trace his medical records everything and you need to look for any exclusion criteria are there if not so only you can think of we can proceed for uh, graft harvesting the graft sorry taking the graft So exclusion criteria are HIV, hepatitis B, C, malignancies, rheumatoid arthritis, autoimmune disease like systemic disease, long-term steroid use, Alzheimer, multiple sclerosis, Charcot's disease, and there are lists. So if you mention few of these things in your exam, so that's enough. Once you screen, once you select that donor is suitable. then you have to retrieval of the graft then graft processing that is a very important area you need to know graft processing the target of this graft processing to remove all debridement and reduce infection what are the start with physical debridement removal of superficial protein and cells and tissues then ultrasonification plus or minus pulsatile lava that removes the cells and blood then alcohol swab that will decrease the viral load and bacterial load in addition to that that will denaturation of the protein happen that happens and then we uh, subsequently we use antibiotic swab that will further decrease the bacterial load and then sterilization process this sterilization is we use gamma radiation and chemicals by this gamma radiation we commonly use the problem is that will reduce their mechanical strength that is the mcq point you need to know then as a last step we do the demineralization by acid what happen once you use acid they dissolve all hydroxyapatite they remain only this type one collagen structural arrangement to give the scapolism that is a graft process after that graft storage and graft transport graft storage is different temperature different time period if it is minus 20 we can keep for one year if it is minus 70 we can use for indefinitely graft preservation technique allograft preservation technique fresh fresh frozen and freeze dried fresh it is we we use immediately it's more immunogenic fresh frozen we keep in that 70 minus 70 least impact on mechanical strength and immunogenicity and that preserves bone mineral proteins in the graft Once in the feed right, that is least immunogenic, lower risk of disease transmission, but bone mineral protein is depleted and structure is weakening during rehydration. If you know this fact, that's enough. Example: cancellous tubes and cortical starch, fresh frozen femoral head. Those are the example for allograft preservation. Uh, allograft. thank you very much that's all about bone bone grafting and bone bank thank you very much uh, ajit that's a very difficult topic with multiple areas and you've covered it quite well um as always orthopedic in within orthopedics this is something that we must know inside out and it's uh, different uh, ways or uh, different applications and so on uh, just a small point um within the uk htlv virus is also legally required to be tested 
HTLV, human T cell lymphotrophic uh, virus, as well as oh. FB, Hep C, syphilis, and HIV. Um, that's for the guys who are sitting the UK exam. Um, the before we move on to questions, I just want to say the Peron, Peron strain theorem is absolutely correct in the way you've described it. But the easier way to remember it is nature heals bones anyway. We just like to think yeah. that we can do that. And uh, for a bone to heal, it eventually needs to get to less than 2% strain to remodel. So if you think about if, if an animal or a, uh, our ancestors broke a bone in the wild, um, we would it, the pain itself would prevent us from moving that decreases the strain. The hematoma that forms will decrease further the strain. The formation of yeah. fibrous type cartilage and or soft callus will decrease the strain further and therefore a harder bone callus forms which decreases strain further and then with uh, activity and stress on this callus you'll get uh, enough strain that you'll get remodeling. Brendan has asked that can we say primary healing is same as intramembranous ossification with endochondral ossification? Uh, pri under primary healing, I doubt whether we can use that two words. Because in intramembranous ossification, it's a kind of a primary healing. It's, but it's not bridging the fracture. It's a two discrete process, but I really doubt whether we can use that two words under primary healing, isn't it, Sean? What is yeah, your idea? I, I, I wouldn't introduce those words. It can be, yeah. but I wouldn't. Um, I, yeah, it, I it, wouldn't. For me, at least, it's com confusion. But to be fair, in the exam, they have said, asked that question. So um, I, just, I just prefer to stick to discussion of uh, primary healing and uh, secondary healing. Um, I don't know if the other mentors have uh, different thoughts. I, yeah, I also feel that primary healing and intramembranous ossification can be kept as two separate processes rather than getting them into one. Yeah. Brendan, do you because uh, it's uh, what I understood this uh, this uh, this two discrete process this mainly that industrial ossification is what we divide as primary and secondary, isn't it? Yeah. Rather uh, than this, it, yeah, intermembranous also is possible because it's happened underneath the periosteum at the fracture site, but it doesn't it doesn't help much for the fracture healing. But when it comes to the fracture healing, that is the industrial ossification that we divide as primary and second. That is the concept I understood, isn't it, Sean? What do you think? Yeah. So I, to be honest, I have difficulty with. Uh, I know. I know it sounds pretty basic, but um, for me, primary has been uh, intramembranous and then the control has been secondary. But I don't like to mix those two concepts, um, mainly because these are the concepts that are designed for bone formation in terms of uh, which type of bone, uh, for example, clavicle uh, versus uh, long bone, sorry, long bone versus uh, flat bone and things like that, how they form yeah. the embryology. But they are, they are the same processes for uh, healing. So in, te in technicality, you can say it. And I suspect a lot of, a lot of people do use it that way. Okay, um, another question that came up was, um, I hope I, we've answered the question. If anyone feels they've a better explanation for this, we would appreciate you coming forward. Um, the uh, DB, uh, so the question is in reference to other for, uh, sources. D, uh, according to Ramachandran, DBM is osteoinductive um, or conductive uh, because osteoinductive, uh, Apparently, ortho bullet says it's only osteoconductive. Anyone, any thoughts on the DBM? Um, to be honest with you, I would have, I've always said it's uh, osteo uh, in, uh, inductive, 
inductor, yeah. Yeah. Um, if you think about it, it has a, it, it's even though it's demineralized, it does have some of the uh, it has it has uh, factors that allow growth in encourages growth in inducts growth in. Okay, um, other questions? Yeah, there are a couple more. Please. One of them was, um, what is the difference between ossification and calcification? Mohammed Gamil asked this. Okay. So in ossification, there is formation of bone matrix as well as the uh, calcification of the bone matrix. So it is uh, uh, a matrix with the calcium, which is inorganic materials like uh, whereas calcification is just inorganic. Uh, yeah. So you, you can say, for example, tendons can become calcified uh, and the process yeah. of calcification. Uh, it's just the mineral deposition of calcium, calcium and phosphate. While ossification is the actual organic bone formation with yeah. calcification as part of it. Normal bone formation. Okay. Um, the last question was what is primary gap healing? Yeah. It is, uh, yeah. It is a gap healing, mean that what they are explaining in the primary healing. We, even though we talk about interfragmentary compression, we cannot achieve the exact contact, even though we achieve the anatomical reduction. Compressed with the disc plate, compression plate, you can see this. There's a tiny gap opposite side. There is some callus formation there. Because even though it is compressed, we can't achieve the exact 100% congruent compression. Because of that, that the the, this is the tension side. There's a tiny bit of gap. That's called gap healing. Even under primary healing. That's why even under primary healing, this and close to the plate, we explain it as a contact healing. Opposite side of the plate, we explain it as a gap healing. Because even, even though we achieved absolute reduction with interfragmentary compression, the achieving the congruent reduction is impossible. That is where develop this gap healing and that's where they explain about gap healing. That's what I understood in, uh, anybody has any different idea, Sean, what do you think? That's correct. So if you ever look at a, a long bone that's been fixed with um, compression plating, if the compression plate is not pre-bent, what you'll see is a small bit of callus uh, formation on the opposite side to the plate. So um, when we say pre-bend, we mean a slight bend on your plate to uh, with concave to the bone. This usually forces the outside, the opposite side to the plate to compress as you uh, tighten the screws. But if it's not done adequately, watch, watch those fractures and you'll see that there is a small little bit of callus formation on the opposite on the opposite side to the plate. Opposite side. Okay. And another point, another point I want to emphasize what they are telling this contact healing, what they are telling the primary healing, that bone union and the cutting cone, that means remodeling. In the primary healing, the remodeling part is cutting cone. This bone union and cutting cone remodeling happen concurrently, mm. simultaneously. When it comes to the gap healing, that happens subsequently. That first bone healing, then remodeling happened. That is the one difference between the contact healing and the gap healing. That's true. Um, an interesting exercise to do with your fracture fixations or with your colleagues' fracture fixations is to actually watch those ones that are plated and see what happens. And then you can see how good your technique for uh, plate reduction technique, sorry, plate compression technique is. Um, 
because I always find it quite interesting. If you watch the uh, side closest to the plate and if there is a osteolysis, uh, significant osteolysis and die back of the bone, that means it's been over compressed. Um, while uh, if there is no osteolysis, but there's no healing on the side next to the plate, that means your fracture hasn't got contact uh, across the bone enough, enough of a small gap or compression that allows primary healing to occur. So therefore you're getting a absence of healing in that area. And often if you watch that, you'll actually see a small uh, gap. Uh, you might even see gap healing on the other side in those patients. But yes, everything, uh, but these are, this is just things to do when you're studying your x-rays uh, to establish how well your operation went with your primary intention of what you were doing. And I appreciate the person who asked that question because that could be a question in your viva exam. Yes. Okay. Um, we'll move on. Thank you, uh, everybody. Um, the uh, Ajit, uh, uh, terrific. Apohani. Apohani, Apohani my apologies. Uh, terrific. No talk. Um, the, uh, it's a difficult topic with lots of different concepts that to put together and apply to clinical scenarios, which uh, you have done quite well. Um, the important uh, thing to remind everybody is that this will be put on the YouTube channel, um, but the next session, the Viva session, will not be recorded. Um, if you wish to review these, this lecture and other lectures, please do go to our uh, uh, YouTube channel. Second, I'd like to thank the uh, mentors um, for their hard work and they did all the work behind the scenes. Um, Haniel Bagasili, Sid Kamant, um, Samir Agarwali, and of course, Nicola Walsh, um, all terrific. Thank you for a good showing from our mentors. Um, and f finally, yes, please, uh, we you can request your CPB points from uh, the FRCS mentor at gmail.com uh, um, for this. We keep a record of who's been here. Um, we can send you the CPB points uh, for a small fee. Um, or you can request within the Telegram group. And with the view of that, you can join the Telegram group by sending me a private message in this chat. I'll write down your numbers and uh, add you to the Telegram group. Uh, finally, um, just a reminder, we have, uh, the mentors have published a book uh, with our editor, Firas Arnold, Concise Orthopedic uh, Notes, uh, just up there behind me. Uh, we, the proceeds of this helps the mentor channel keep going in terms of uh, paying for the Zoom and all the other technology parts of all of this. We feel that our book is uh, though we say concise, is actually very adequate for revision for the FRCS exam and all the other exit exams associated with orthopedics. We've purposely designed it as a multimedia type uh, textbook and you can either get it as a, uh, through Google Books or Amazon or you can uh, buy the hard copy. It has lots of uh, information that we feel is very pertinent to the exams. Uh, thank you everybody for today's uh, talk and participation, we will stop recording here.